to just to play it safe and make sure we have a record of things. So okay, so yeah, that's going. Um, just so the recording catches all this. Okay, um, so let's talk about this class and like how it's gonna work. I just made a bullet point of things that I wanna that I wanna kind of mention and then and then yeah, like um, ask questions if anything is unclear. So the schedule for this class is really it's, it's like a bullet class. We're gonna be if you can believe it, six weeks from today we're done, right? Which is which is really crazy. So the the class is actually seven weeks, which means that the week seven is in is in six weeks. So um, and it's it, there's no missed weeks. We're just every Thursday here, twelve to what is it? Twelve ten to forty. I think that's correct. And so this class is going to go by in a flash. So we're going to try to like get into it really really quickly. Um, this the open secret though is that the class for me is part of a much longer term endeavor. And so I'm hoping that this class is kind of a catalyst for uh, kind of bootstrapping, uh, bootstrapping this bigger project off of this class, and then it will go on into the spring. So, for, uh, so don't, don't think of it just as contained within this, uh, these seven weeks. I actually want this idea to just met, to, to basically take over your entire consciousness. Like it's going to be, um, it's going to be, be well. The scope of it, as you'll see, is is, is very grand, beyond all of us. I think. Um, now, uh, office hours. So I, I wanted to. I'm going to actually do the formally, like put the office hours in the calendar so people can sign up. I didn't do that last semester, and it caused a lot of confusion. So, um, but I wanted to maybe just get a sense of what people's availabilities are. So, um, like, ra raise your hand if you're generally in here on Mondays. Okay. Raise your hand if you're generally here on Tuesdays. Uh, Wednesdays. Thursdays. Okay. So are there any days that, the, that like, a, a chunk of the class tends not to be here? Fridays, right? It's kind of the... Um, okay. Like, maybe it makes more sense to just... Uh, so, what, what I'm going to do is maybe... Maybe I'll take a poll and then I'll try to... Uh, the reason why I'm sorting out office hours is because I'm actually going to be here more or less every day. So technically, office hours can be all the time. Like, you can just drop in. Um, I'll try to make some official office hours that, uh, that at least match up as much with everyone's availability as possible. Um, I know everyone kind of takes classes at different times, right? Um, is there any exception to that rule? Like, it's basically everyone's classes are all over the map. Okay, all right, I'll just take a poll. Um, okay, we are a team. So what do I mean by this? So the, the, way, this, the way this class is going to work, and this is one of the experimental elements, is that the goal is actually not for everyone to make an individual project, but rather for everyone to contribute to one pro project that we're all going to make together, like a team. Um, so, uh, and you'll see why uh, when we get into the, the description of what the course actually is about, like what this idea of an autonomous artificial artist is and why it requires such a, such a kind of setup. Um, and so basically the way that you're evaluated is really just based on coming in and, and participating as, as best as you can. Uh, because the nice thing about working as a team is that everyone has different skills and all of those skills can actually be used to fuse together a sort of project that really makes use of everyone's skills. That means that if you, which is great because if you have some, if some people, if you don't have certain skills that other people have, then we can kind of figure out a way to like glue these together. We're all organs in a, in a, in a sort of, in a living being that we're going to create. Um, one thing I was thinking to do, uh, how many people here have or use Slack consistently, relatively? Uh, because uh, do, do people here like have Slack channels for other classes? Is that, is that a normal thing? Okay. Uh, no, not normal. Okay. Well, I, 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 I won't make this like a strict requirement, but it'll be very helpful at least. I'm thinking to maybe make a Slack channel, and I already have a Slack group that I manage, which we're, I'm going to show you some stuff. I'll show you ML Frey in, in a bit, but for those, who, um, so some, so a lot of you, especially those of you who took my course last semester, are familiar with this website called mlfrey.github.io. Uh, oops, what's going on here? Um, which is a basically like a, a repository of helpful resources for getting started with machine learning for art, art and creativity. And I actually have a Slack channel, a Slack group, 
which which probably some of you are already on. Like, raise your hand if you're on that. Check the slide. Okay, just a couple people. Um, but basically, what I want to do is make a channel within that group that will be just for the class. And in the class, we can we can basically discuss. Like, and it probably won't be useful for you for the first couple weeks. Let's say, like in the beginning, I'll just post stuff there. So one thing I'll post. We'll get into the assignment later, but we're going to talk about project art projects that are mass collaborative, and I'm going to post all the links there. So like that'll be just a good way of, of um, uh, like better than email, I think, and we can hopefully try to create some discussion. And it's also because it'll be within the ML for a Slack group that might just be useful in general to check if you're interested in, in the topic of machine learning. Um, there's like around 800 people in that Slack, so there's pretty good activity. Um, so it's definitely worth just like you know being being there, um, reading stuff. So I, I'll send an email about that later today. Um, so that's that's going to be oops, that'll be um, the goal. Um, oh, I forgot to mention uh, this picture. So this is uh, ITP's newest best friend. Um, this is a uh, a machine that we just got uh, that we just bought uh, that or <laughs> ITP just bought uh, for uh, the purposes of basically for the purposes of, of machine learning. More or less right now, it's, I'm tending to it. Um, it. It has four GPUs in it, and so it's a really, really powerful, like, beastly machine, and I believe it is going to be the host to our autonomous artificial artist. That's the goal. Um, right now, it's sitting in the residence office, which is downstairs on the third floor, um, and at, at some point, that'll have to change because the residence office is only going to be there until March or April. Um, we'll figure out a way. I actually, like, I was thinking it would be really cool to keep it in here. <laughs> But then that's kind of tricky because then there's like um, other classes and stuff. So I don't know. Well, I'm gonna figure that out. But for anyone who's interested in doing deep learning projects, like this is this is gonna be it. like it, this is like not being used at all right now. It's just me. So um, so come into office hours. <laughs> like let's talk about it. Um, okay, recording. Um, so like I, I already mentioned this, I'm recording the lectures. But but uh, besides for this one, this class is is probably not gonna be very lecture heavy. Like I'm going to try to introduce the concept uh, uh, like over the, it, it'll be less lecture heavy than last class basically. I'm hoping that we set aside as much of this class as possible, like mostly starting next week, to uh, like at least half of every class to begin building, like more or less. And that's why it won't work so well in recorded format, but, but at least the lectures will be useful for you to just have on there. Um, so I'll distribute the links for that uh, as we go. Okay, yeah, like I said, this class is like um, <laughs> heavy on inspiration, uh, improvisation, well, inspiration too, but he heavy on improvisation makes it sound like I'm un unprepared, which is like true in some ways, but it's also a, a factor of being very prepared. So we, we actually, I, I, as, as far as the machine learning stuff goes, we have more stuff than we know what to do with it, what to do with and so I'm hoping that by keeping this class very loose, we might actually um, we might actually be able to figure out whatever route we want to take, like with with everyone's input, uh, in a way that's kind of going to make use of your skills as much as possible. Now, um, uh, yeah, and so this is this class, like besides for today, um, and and you know, like gradually, I, I'm hoping that that we um, make it as much workshop oriented that we'll actually begin to build stuff or or we'll see how exactly it ends up working like I know classes tend to be like classes are classes and workshops are workshops so maybe it makes sense to do like sort of let's say like uh, discussion stuff like to figure out what we want to build um, I think that'll probably be end up kind of how maybe the last few weeks will be very much like us building but the middle weeks will be like maybe just discussion um, you can see, like, we're figuring this out as we go. Like, I, I have very few plans. Um, but a lot of material, and most of it's going to be left on the cutting room floor. And that's just kind of the result of, of um, well, having such a short amount of time. ITB F18, what, are, what am I talking about? So in the, if you go in the Malfrey GitHub.io and you go to Classes, and you go to the very top one called the Neural Aesthetic, Fall 18, this is... The, the class that I taught in this room here with, with you know, a handful of you um, who were in that class uh, in the fall. And all of the lectures, uh, this, is a, this is a full semester class, so that was, that was uh, there were four, 14 classes, I believe. 
And so all of the video lectures and the slides and all of the code is essentially in here. Um, so for, for those of you who are, um, uh, for those of you who didn't take that class, I would highly encourage, uh, it's not strictly, I mean, it's not strictly required, I couldn't require like half of you to take the previous class, but it would be super helpful. And this will give you a lot of skills that we're going to go over very, like, succinctly, let's say. Um, because, so last, last semester we spent a lot of time just learning the nuts and bolts of like, training generative models on, on GPUs, right? And all of that stuff, it takes some time to get used to. Now, the way this class is going to work is that not everyone will have to have that skill. So that's totally fine. But the more people that have that skill, like, definitely uh, will, at the very least, improve your understanding of what the possibilities are. Uh, but also, you'll be in a better position to, to actually, like, code stuff and, and maybe, um, maybe make smaller versions of it. Um, all of those skills are very, very useful to have, as, as anyone who has them can tell you. Um, but yeah, anyway, I would, I would very much encourage you to look through these. And, and actually, like in the, later in the homework, I'll, I'll mention that generative models are... are um, um, I'm going to suggest that people watch this if, if you haven't taken the class. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's kind of... ISP F18 is your name, so you, you can find that there. So we're going to use a bunch of tools in this class, and, and again, like the, uh, we're, uh, I should say, we're not going to use all of these. These are all candidate tools. So these are things that may end up being part of the artist, the autonomous artificial artist. Um, we're going to lean on Runway a little bit. I'm, I'm really excited about Runway, so a lot of you probably know what Runway is. How many people here don't, do not know what Runway is? Okay. Uh, most of you know it because it's, it started out as an ITP project. Um, so uh, your, your cohort, Chris Valenzuela, who uh, was a graduate of ITP last year, I believe. Yeah, so, so maybe some of you don't know him too well. But he was a resident this year. And um, he and now also um, Alejandro, who was also in the same class. Um, and then the former ITP, I think even, even one year before that, um, uh, Anastasis, so maybe some of you know. They basically just started a company called Runway. And Runway, they're making an application that's going to basically make it super easy to set up machine learning models that use external GPUs in a in like a double click like application, like a super super straightforward like uh, straightforward way of using it. I think it'll become a plugin for things like Touch Designer and Unity and all these things, and it's going to become easier than ever to incorporate machine learning models into what you use. That's why, that's why actually like a lot of the stuff I was saying about being able to use a terminal and all that, that, that may eventually become unnecessary, which, which is really exciting, I think. Um, because the fewer computer science skills you need to be able to use this stuff, the, the more easy it, it becomes to incorporate it into whatever it is that you're doing. So I'm going to show Runway at some point, probably next week. Um, it's in beta right now. It's also just really exciting because they just started this project. It has it has a ton of potential. Um, I think it's uh, it's like there have been a handful of ITP projects turned into like it was his um, like dissertation basically, and you know there have been a handful of those that turn into full fledged companies. I believe Foursquare is one, right? So Foursquare is a former ITP project. Um, so I think Runway has, has a lot of potential. I'm going to show you a bunch of deep learning frameworks. So we'll talk about TensorFlow and Torch and what all those are. Um, ML5 will also feature here, another ITP project. Um, so for those of you who, who don't know, ML5 is basically a JavaScript library for deep learning in the browser. It is built on top of uh, something called TensorFlow.js, which is a, um, like a very, very functional... JavaScript-based, uh, Google-backed uh, deep learning library. Yeah, that's a lot of words uh, to describe it, but it's super, super nice. And, and uh, ML5 is really nicely complementary with P P5. Uh, a lot of the examples are, are just are basically P5 sketches that have ML5 uh, as a library. So for those of you who are doing P5 stuff, ML5 is, is going to be really, really, um, really, really helpful. Um, We'll see how many, like, we might use some of the open frameworks tools. I've been developing a lot of open frameworks tools over the last few years to do some, to do machine learning stuff in open frameworks. How many people here are open frameworks users? Okay, one, a little bit. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, these are, they're all pre-built projects, so um, 
Um, so so I, may, I may still just kind of like distribute them and I'll show you how they work. Oh, actually a nice thing to know, how many people here do not have Macs? Who's on PC? Uh, raise your hand if you're on PC. There are no PCs here? There's one in the back. I mean, one in the back? Not the PC. Okay. All right. Well, that, that's the reason why I ask is because the ML for A OFX, the open frameworks tools that I built, they, they mostly only work on Mac, annoyingly, and because of some limitations in Windows. They actually work decently on Linux too, but Windows is like, um, Windows is, just forget about Windows, like in this, in this entire <laughs> class. We're not going to, we're going to try to stay as far away from Windows as possible sure. because they do everything differently. Um, so like, for example, Runway can't run on Windows because because of the dependencies. But anyway. Um, uh, no, it's actually Linux. It's, it's Linux, yeah. Uh, but but Linux is even, Linux is ideal and Mac is fine, basically. Uh, because Mac is, is just a copy of Linux with an Apple on top of it. So that's all. Um, and lots of, you know, copyrights. Uh, then Wekinator might also factor into this. So like hopefully we'll add an interactive layer on top of the installation. Um, obviously, like interactivity is the wheelhouse of ITP, and so uh, Wekinator might be very useful for that. How many people have used Wekinator? Okay, Wekinator, fantastic project. <laughs> right on. Um, Wekinator is a fantastic project, um, and like we'll all introduce Wekinator probably next week. Uh, other things like Unity, uh, Touch Designer. Some people are probably really good at those things. I'm myself like. Um, I'm not super, super good at it. I know Aiden got into uh, a lot of like really cool um, uni uh, Unity stuff. Um, anyone use Touch Designer? Touch Designer, yeah? To. Okay. Um, touch Designer is kind of neat. I, I don't have much experience with it myself, but it looks like it's very much uh, like, like might be really nice with Runway together. Anyway, we'll get into all the mechanics like later. Um, so then the idea is that we'll have the last class will be will be this project. We're going to build the artist and make a, a cacophony of, of, of sound and light in here. Um, that's the goal. And we'll see, like, you know, reach for the stars and you'll land it. Well, what is it? Like, re who knows that saying? Reach for the, the quasars and you'll land the stars. So land, uh, shoot for the moon and land among the stars, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the reason why that doesn't make sense to me is that the stars are actually farther away. Yeah. So, so, reach for the stars and we'll land on the moon. That, that's better, right? Like, because because if you land on the moon, that's pretty awesome, right? But anyway, um, but like I said, really, this is this is truly like the beginning of something, and and I'll I'll discuss that like later in the semester. I have a project that I'm basically trying to trying to like um, yeah initiate. Okay, uh, another thing that will be very, um, very much like pegged to this class, um, although like, like I said, not strictly necessary, not strictly required, and certainly lots of you like probably won't even be able to make these. But uh, since last semester, I've been running this meetup called AI Lab, which has been every Friday from five to six thirty. Um, last semester, it was in that it was uh, mostly it shifted around a little bit, but it was mostly in the room by the elevator. Um, now it will be uh, in room 50. Um, so basically, the goal of AI Lab has been has been a few. It's been it's been kind of complementary to the ML5 meetup, except it's it's about machine learning, but not focused strictly on ML5. And um, we'll, we'll I'll, I'll show like I'll show the latest and greatest things that are happening in the world of machine learning and AI, and. Um, you know, and also like another another thing is like a lot of uh, people are able to present things they're working on. So tomorrow, Dan Oved, one of your cohorts here, is going to show something in AI Lab. I've also occasionally had speakers come over. So last year, last semester, we had uh, Memo Acton, we had Yannick from um, from TestFlow.js come by. Stefania, who is uh, who's actually a res who's starting as a resident here this um, this spring, will, uh, was there last year. Had uh, Helena Seren, who's a wonderful artist. Um, that's a picture of her. And then um, Irene Alvarado is also an like, excellent artist and a technologist at Google who worked on PoseNet, which we'll see later. Um, she, she spoke here. Uh, at some point, we'll have Allison come give a talk. And obviously, every, I'm sure everyone knows Allison. Um, I also um, already planned um, uh, 
Alice Stewart, who probably less of you know, you know yeah, Alice Stewart, yeah, yeah. Um, who's, uh, who's also like an excellent artist from the UK, who, who took a workshop with me like a couple of years ago along with Roland. Um, <laughs> And then hopefully I'm going to get my, my frequent collaborator, Andreas Rafsgaard. Uh, you also know, uh, hopefully he'll be in New York later. And then, yeah, hopefully we'll get, like, it, it can be very spontaneous. Um, hopefully we'll get some people to give some talks. Yes? Is there any chance you can change the There is a chance, uh, but it, it, uh, basically I want to make it so that as many people can make it as possible. And that was kind of the, the, the I was told that Friday is the best day so because... At 5:50. Oh, it ends at 5:50. Yeah. Interesting. So one option was to do it at 5:30, uh, because because we could get a room from like 5:30 to. So like uh, I I had was given the option at 5:30, and I thought it would be too late for a lot of people. Like like how late do people, you know, do you like still be here at seven o'clock on a on a Can on a Friday? Like <laughs> Maybe. Well, the problem is that the ML5 meetup is 1 to 3. How many people here are not available from 5 to 6.30? Okay, and then also Stefania. Hmm. Well, okay, well, it won't be over at 5.50, so it's definitely not, like, I'm thinking it'll continue to go until 6.30. So let's, let me, let me think about it. Like, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll also send a poll. Tomorrow it'll be at 5 because it's kind of too late to change it, but maybe, maybe we might be able to shift it. Uh, my goal is for it to go, like, I will just stay in, uh, as long as everyone else is staying, more or less. Generally speaking, tomorrow I have to leave, like, at 6.20 or something like that, but, but def in generally speaking, I'll, I'll try to make it as late as possible. Um, well, let's, let's talk. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's, that's AI Lab. Okay, uh, what I want to do is do a round of introductions, um, basically, so I can start to get to know everybody a little bit, and um, let's just see how, how time is going. Um, we're 12.40, we started at 12.10, and we go until 2.40, okay, and we'll take a break at some point. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, well, I already, okay, you guys know I'm Gene, uh, you can find all my stuff here. And basically, like uh, I want the only thing I want to present, show you is mlfreda.github.io, which I already showed you the website. It's basically a whole bunch of um, like resources in the form of interactive JavaScript um, uh, like demos that do various cool things in machine learning in the browser. A bunch of uh, Jupyter Python notebooks that show you how to do. Uh, more like using the deep learning frameworks to train generative models, um, some guides on how to create interactive things using the ML for A, um, OFX, like the open frameworks uh, stuff. There's a bunch of, bunch of practical resources and lots of you have already used them. Uh, we leaned pretty heavily on it in the last uh, semester. We'll lean a little bit less on it this semester, I suppose, but, but definitely this is going to be like very useful um, for you if you're really interested in this topic. Um, and uh, and I'll, at some point I'll do a showcase of the tools. Maybe I might actually do an AI lab at some point. But but anyway, um, that will be available for everybody. So these are just some of the highlights of them. All these guides also are, are kind of like, most of them are notebooks. And a lot of them are just online now. Um, they used to be like Jupyter notebooks that you would have to download and install somewhere. Um, now we have things like Colab, which is, so a lot of these just link to Colab, so you just run it in the browser. It's like easier than ever. Um, and actually the demos now link to the P5 um, web editor. So now like all of this stuff you can just do in your browser. So it's, it's really getting to be like that, that surreal. Yeah, these demos, uh, not all of them are uh, P5 uh, web editor, We're, like gradually shifting, but, um, but yeah, those are kind of useful. <coughs> Um, yeah, I've been giving a lot of workshops, and that's basically the tools have all come out of there. So these are just some highlights. And I record, frequently record a lot of my classes. Actually, this you're looking at is, is from my first class at ITP, um, from all the way back in ancient 2016. Look how young I look. Um, so yeah, so if, um, that was the first time I taught here, and, actually, and that class was called Machine Learning for Artists, and then basically I'm afraid of GitHub.io came out of that. Um, so, but the most recent class is actually your friend. Um, this is, and I'll share the slides by the way. So if anyone is like feverishly trying to type down the links, uh, just know you'll, you'll get that. 
Um, so yeah, this was the last class, and this is probably the most mature class, so I think um, this will probably be the most helpful for you. Okay, now finally, let's talk about this autonomous artificial artist idea. Um, the goal of the class, uh, actually I should say, not quite the goal of the class, but the the goal in general, and then the goal of the class is going to be a safer, easier version of the goal in general. The goal is to create an autonomous artificial artist. I'm going to define what I mean by that in the next few slides, basically. Um, the goal of the class will be to create a somewhat limited version of, of it because we have only six weeks. So, um, And we're going to explore some of the relevant components. Um, however, I will discuss at least, like I'll introduce all of the relevant components of the, of the hive goal, like the autonomous artificial artist, I'll introduce all of that stuff in, the, in these next few weeks. Like we'll have, we'll have like a, probably a short lecture each week because I want to, uh, for those of you who took the class last semester, you, the, my last lecture was introducing this class and it was all just like mashed together into one lecture and I think it like was out of, out of, the or, out of hand. It really takes time to digest each component and then just, you know, trying to think about how they fuse together. Um, because ultimately, like, the, the idea is, is very much at the intersection of three really different fields, um, and uh, which, which are these three, basically. Computational arts, especially, like, digital generative art, like, right, we're going to talk about generative art, um, and interactive art. So computational arts, which is kind of the most familiar here, and then deep learning, which is, you know, machine learning, uh, like, to the nth degree, right? So we're going to talk a lot about deep learning and what that, what that allows us to do. Um, last class was basically computational arts plus deep learning. It was, it, was, it was all of the things that you can do at the intersection of those two things. Um, the additional thing that we're actually not going to study in too much detail, at least practically speaking, because it's too far out of left field, but is important to the concept, and, and I'll talk about how it fits in, is this idea of like crypto economics and decentralization. Um, now, that may sound like, like it has nothing to do with these other two things, but I assure you it does. And I'm going to make the case for you over the next few weeks. I'll make a short case of it today, um, but kind of introduce it over, over time. Um, it's not just my crackpot idea. There are people talking about these things. Um, now, if you haven't heard of this term crypto economics, it's kind of like an idea floating around the, the crypto space, like the, the blockchain and decentralization space. And the idea is that through decentralization technologies, your blockchains, your tokens, your, your DIOs and all that, um, we're able to create essentially new forms of interaction online that are mediated by tokens that include uh, some notion of value that you can actually analyze at, with, with standard economic analysis. And using those tools, you can create very interesting, like completely unknown, hitherto unknown forms of interacting online. Um, now, like that sounds really high level, and that, again, that will elaborate on over the course of the semester. Um, but most people think the whole decentralization thing is about is about libertarian ideas, like get the government off of whatever, but, but, it's, but that's just like one corner of it. Really like this is, and, it, and it, I wasn't interested in it all personally until, until it clicked for me that you can actually create new forms of interaction using these tools that, that really can't work otherwise. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about decentralization stuff a lot. Um, however, what we're not really going to do in this class, just to make, keep it practical, is we're not going to implement smart contracts. We're not going to put stuff on the blockchain because it will be too much. Um, however, the goal, the project moving past this this class will actually get into that. And so this is going to be hopefully like a springboard to that. But we're going to mostly focus on um, the stuff that is most relevant to you as ITP students, certainly, like like computational arts, of course, and, and, and machine learning. And then the, the crypto part will be more of a maybe like Spiritual guide, let's call it. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what I mean by that. We're gonna mostly gonna, in the practical sense, we're gonna mostly focus on these two, and we're not really gonna, we're not gonna implement any crypto stuff, but we will talk about it. Okay, so yeah, deep learning is all about. Um, I'm gonna introduce that um, more, more generically in a moment. But deep learning is this field of machine learning that has become all the rage in the last few years. Of course, everybody hears about it all the time, and it's because it's it's machine learning that actually works. Um, so, like, machine learning up until five years ago didn't work. 
it basically didn't work at anything, and so it was just kind of like an academic topic, but suddenly it actually starts to work at doing things that are useful to people. Everyone's hearing about all these medical applications, and uh, there's, uh, of course, computer vision is a, is a big area of machine learning that it, for things like self-driving cars and actually all the medical stuff is basically computer vision. Um, your chatbots and your, and your uh, audio tools are all basically doing, using machine learning in some, in, in some form or another. And this was, I introduced a lot of this in much more detail in the last class. Um, which, and of course, obviously we're not going to be able to do that in this class because of shortage of time, but um, I very much, for, if you're interested, especially in this, I very much encourage you to take, take a look at that class online. Uh, the whole crypto economics thing has to do with um, a lot of new ideas, many of which are very hypothetical and like not tested at all and still still very much like in, in development are these ideas of using tokens in interesting, in interesting interactive scenarios. I'm going to talk about things like what I'm going to, I'm going to introduce these really quickly today, but we'll leave aside a fuller lecture to introduce the notion of curation markets, which are a very interesting idea that's floating around this space right now. Again, very much untested. There's like a few projects online. Um, so, and then that's, that should get you excited, right? We're talking about ideas that are very much in their infancy. And um, the risk is that they may become irrelevant in a few years. Maybe they die off and, you know, because they're not actually all they're cracked up to be. Or maybe they'll be like the next architecture for many of the, many of the online services, the, the next generation of online services, right? Um, and people have big ideas, right? Like, like people want to, What's the next generation of, of, of tools that we're going to use online? You know, if this generation is your, your Googles and your Facebooks, what's the next generation, right? What are things that are fundamentally different um, from, from those? Uh, the, these are the ideas that may actually enable that, I think. Um, lots of people think. Uh, and then, of course, like the gener computational generative art. So this, is, uh, this was, as, you, as you'll see in every magazine, and AI made this. Yeah, <laughs> and AI made this painting. It looks a lot like a Jackson Pollock because it's kind of learned how to make Jackson Pollock stuff. And we'll talk about how this kind of stuff is made. Um, and yes, the holy grail is this autonomous artificial artist. And I'm going to, again, like uh, I'm punting this. I'm going to describe it in, in more detail like throughout the semester as we go. But um, But for now, like I'll give you the... The, the shortest approximation I can, it's basically a decentralized autonomous organization whose goal is to generate art, like generate images and sounds and text. And the way that it works is by interacting with all of us. It's like an independent entity. Imagine it's sitting at the middle of the table here and we're all around it and we're feeding it. You know, we're feeding it data, we're feeding it code. We're feeding it media. We're feeding, and maybe, and, it, we're, and then we're creating some sort of an interactive scenario to, to sort of interact with it, to, to guide it, and um, and so that that's that's really like that's the so that's the goal for the class, right? We're gonna make this part of it. The the like more high level goal incorporates these things like curation markets and tokens in order to create incentives for people, basically everywhere, anyone to, to uh, participate. Um, incentives is the, is the name of the game when it comes to crypto economics, right? It's, it's economics after all. You can think of everything in terms of incentives. Like what are your incentives to, to give code to this, to give data to it, to give compute to it? Um, and, and we'll talk about how that factors in. Um, but we're, we're mostly going to, we're gonna be basically, um, we'll, let, let's say like we'll, We'll be an autocracy in here. There's no, there will be no incentives other than to, than, other, other, other than hypotheticals. But, um, but we'll talk about how that stuff actually becomes relevant later. So yeah, this is mashing up creative AI and especially generative models. Um, we'll talk about this notion of autonomous organizations. I'm going to introduce the concept of a DAO, um, a decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, we'll talk about crypto economics and token engineering probably in later lectures, like let's say week three, week four. Um, 
And then this notion of multiplayer games, game theory is also kind of relevant. That, that's sort of, you could subhead it under crypto economics because it's really sort of game theory in disguise. Um, game theory on the internet, more or less. And, um, and then we'll talk about also, and this is something that, that will be part of the homework, which is going to be more of the art, art stuff. So like collaborative artworks, like what is, what is a collaborative artwork? How do you, how do you create modes of interaction where many people can collaborate on a single artwork? And, then, and I'll show some examples of that. And I'll actually ask you to bring in examples of that as well. And I'll discuss that later. Okay, now, um, why are we making autonomous artificial artists? Uh, um, I suppose it makes more sense to elaborate on what is an autonomous artificial artist. Um, but okay, like, so that would have been made more sense to order it. But okay, I'll, I'll go in the order of the slides. Why an autonomous artificial artist? So, uh, like, and this is, this is more on a personal level. So, like, what interests me about it? And I hope, I hope it interests you as well. So for me, like the reason why I've always been interested in, in machine learning is I've always been interested in this idea of the hive mind, you know, like the, the sort of our collective unconscious, right? This collective unconscious idea has existed for a hundred years at least, um, going back to like, going back to the psychoanalysts, like, you know, the Carl Jung tradition and so on. And, um, and there's, there's a lot to it. Like there's a, there's a sort of like, we have this kind of like psychological fabric that unites all of us. There's something like very truly special about being a human being, right? And, um, but the, the problem with psychoanalysis is that it's, it's untestable. It's, it's, it, you can't manifest it in the real world. It's like this, it's just like, it's an idea. And, and a lot of people think it's a crazy, like stupid idea. And it might be a crazy, stupid idea for all I know. But, um, but it is an interesting idea. And, um, and this, I think, maybe gives us the, the crudest possible tool to actually realizing it in matter that, that we have. Um, and actually, like, uh, I've, been, I've, been, I've become interested in, in the work of a, of a um, what would you call it, like a neuropsychopharmacologist or something, something like that, who thinks that, that you could do the same thing through psychedelic drugs, but that's actually a whole other, um, whole other topic which we can, maybe that'll be lecture eight. <laughs> so, but anyway, like this, this is a different way through machine learning that we can actually like maybe um, uh, have a way to test this idea. So um, we're all collaborating, whether we know it or not, on creating just the most massive trove of, of data that has ever existed in, in the world. And it's just getting bigger and bigger all the time. Today, there is more data than ever has been on the earth, ever. And tomorrow, there will be even more, right? And it's, it's like uh, exabytes of data, I believe, the latest estimate. Um, and it's just, uh, and all of this data is telling a story about us, right? Telling a story about what it means to be a human, telling a story about, uh, about everything, that, about how we perceive the world, right? When you take photographs and then you write down what's going on in those photographs, you're making a connection between the real world and you're in your sort of human experience of it, right? And all of this data is out there. And I think, and, the, and what, what's interesting about generative models, which we're going to talk about, is that they actually create a model of this relationship, right? They create a model of the world based on our descriptions of it, based on our perception and our descriptions of it. Kind of like a link between our, between the actual world, you know, the, the, the bits of it, the matter, and the way we perceive it, right? And, and so, like, this is just an example of what you can do with generative models, right? So maybe some of you saw this attention GAN thing where you, you, where you type out a sentence, a woman is eating a delicious sandwich, and then you generate an image of a woman eating a delicious sandwich. And isn't that lovely, right? So, and, and it's, it's, it's um, well, okay, so this is, it's a little bit like a, a, a neural network imagining things, right? And its capacity to imagine is quite astonishing. And I'll show you some, some examples of generative models and the things that they can produce. They produce images that are, that are very evocative, right? And that's why they've been getting so much attention, right? They, they don't make any sense, really, but they evoke images that, that do kind of make sense. And they're becoming increasingly realistic, right? We're actually uh, slowly acquiring the ability to, to actually model this, this, this real-world space, right? This, this sort of, like... This, this repository of data that we, we're slowly beginning to be able to tame it, right, and actually use it somehow. 
And so for me, the generative models are a window into this idea of the, of the collective imagination. I've been really interested in this, like even before I knew I was interested in it, I was doing projects that were, that were trying to go at this. So like one of my first projects from machine learning was this color of words idea project. And I made this in like 2010 or 11, and then I completely forgot about it almost for five years or something like that. And I only became, have you ever done that where you made something a long time ago and then you forgot about it, or didn't forget about it, but it was whatever, just one of your projects. And then five years later, you come back to it and you're like, this is actually more relevant than I realized. You know? mm -hmm. So this is kind of, I think, maybe the first thing in this space. So this project was basically trying to uh, visualize colors associated with words via Google image searches. So you take, for example, a Google image search on winter, and then you download all the images, and then you try to visualize the, color, the dominant color distribution of them. And the way that it would be done would be using something that's called a self-organizing map. Uh, that's the way that this was done. Self-organizing map is basically an um, obsolete, like, um, a machine learning algorithm, which has been more or less replaced by more modern ones, but it helps you visualize data. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, a lot of these should make sense. You know, fall is very orange. I know it's a little hard to see the colors here. Rainforest is kind of this deep green. I have things like holidays, you know, it's Valentine's Day is coming up. Very pink. Um, St. Patrick's Day also coming up, right? That's in March. <laughs> very green and so on. So this, this is kind of like, this is the first attempt at, at, at trying to like tap into this collective mind that we have. And, um, and, and so yeah, that, well that was, that was kind of like, that was the goal of this project. But now we have much more, much more sophisticated versions of this that can entirely imagine the, what it looks, what a particular sentence looks like. Like a woman is eating a delicious sandwich. Now if you, now this, this doesn't look that, that great, but they do have in limited, in more, under more limited um, semantics, they, they have things that do look pretty realistic. So if you do something like a pizza, is being made in the brick oven, it looks damn well like a pizza, like pretty, pretty damn close. So this, this stuff, I guarantee you in one year, it'll make stuff that um, is clo as close to realistic as you can imagine, like a woman eating a delicious sandwich. It'll be like, you know, pretty, pretty close to the real thing. So yeah, the, this autonomous artificial artist is a decentralized AI which generates art. And, and I'll discuss why it has to be decentralized. I think it has to be decentralized. That's actually the only way it would, it would make sense. Um, now, le before we get into decentralization, let's talk about what we mean by autonomous. And let me just see what time it is. It's uh, 1.05. So wait, it, we started at 12.10, and we go until 2.40. So I'll go maybe another, let me just see what this slide looks like. Um, I see a good place to stop before taking a break. Um, uh -huh. Yes, perfect. Okay, so I'll finish these next few slides and then we'll take a break and then, we'll, and then I'm going to do a review of the last class. So, autonomous. What, what do I mean by autonomous? Um, autonomy it, it means the following things. Like, like, and we're going to kind of define it, right? By autonomous, we mean autonomous in the sense that all of us are autonomous from each other, right? Um, we, the ability to act independently of us, and, and by us I mean us people, right? So this autonomous artificial artist must be able to act independently of us. So, um, and, um, and what, what do we mean by independently, right? Well, again, like I always use the analogy of just another human being, right? Each of you have your own consciousness, right? I have my conscious, I can, I'm own, like my perception is inside of this head. And I can't, although I'd love to, but I cannot get into any of your heads, right? That would be really interesting if you could, if you could do that, but so far we haven't figured out a way to do it. Um, I've been reading all this, like, like, for the first time, consciousness theory, and it's all super crazy and confusing, right? And actually, like, the, there's an interesting conundrum, which is that I don't know that all of you are conscious. You could all be automatons, right? <laughs> and only I'm, I might be the only conscious being. And maybe all of you think the same thing about yourself. Um, <laughs> Uh, or maybe we're all actually, we have one consciousness. Who knows? It's, it's actually very difficult to, to know. But, um, but we'll, we'll make some assumptions here that all of us are, are conscious beings. Um, and, and that we basically, you have the ability to sort of will your own body, more or less. 
Um, so that's what we mean. Um, now, of course, like we, we, we can't make another human being, but we might be able to, through a lot of these new tools, make software that very much acts independently of humans. Um, and that, that's really the, the key thing that the whole like blockchain and decentralization space is, is forget all the social consequences like the libertarian, the libertarian panaceas, all of those probably won't really happen. But what will happen is that we're going to have this like computer that is beyond this gigantic computer that's beyond anybody's reach. And, and all of us can, can send programs to it. And then those programs are effectively by, you know, acting independently that, um, because they can't be stopped. More or less, that's that's kind of um, unless you turn off the entire electrical grid in the entire world. So like you would have to. So that that was that's what it would take to to actually like make these things turn off. Uh, but that gives it at least one component of of uh, autonomy, which is the ability to act independently. You create a program and you put it on a computer that no one can turn on or off or regulate, and then it's basically at that point it's independent. Um, now, of course, that's very dangerous. Um, so we'll talk about some of the dangers that come with that. Uh, but it's also very interesting. Like even dangerous things are interesting, uh, in some sense. Um, okay. So uh, other also um, now another no, one one thing that autonomous sometimes uh, a, a misconception that sometimes uh, comes up is uh, people think autonomous means that it acts alone, sort of like it's some sort of an agent that that is basically um, you know alone more or less. But, but that's actually not, not correct, right? Because all of us interact with each other, right? We're autonomous beings interacting with each other. And so the ability to interact with all of us without being subordinated to us, right? That, and that's kind of like, you know, like a free person, right? Like I make this, again, like the person analogy usually works. Um, so um, the ability to, to that, that we'll be able to interact with it, it will, we can guide its behavior, we can influence its behavior, um, it can sort of play off of us, right? Um, so, so interaction is actually necessary. And again, that's like a person, right? People are autonomous, but they do are influenced by each other, right? So this is, will be another autonomous, but influential being. Influential no. <laughs> being that can be influenced, let's say. Um, now this, without being subordinated to any of us, right? That means, um, that means that like the, that this agent is, is not, uh, is not overly controlled by the influence of one person, right? Because that would actually defeat the whole autonomy aspect, right? A robot that you can turn on or off with your finger uh, is not autonomous, right? I think. Um, so decentralization helps because it actually creates practical mechanisms to, uh, to, to make it so that not, no one of us can unduly influence the, the agent, right? So that, and that's why the whole decentralization autonomy are very much linked. And, um, and yeah, and also one thing about autonomy is that we, and uh, well, I'm not sure if this is necessarily a property, but, uh, but I think it might as well be, is that its behavior is, it becomes a bit unpredictable. You know, the way that we, I mean, you can, we can kind of predict a little bit what each other are going to do. You know, like I imagine everyone's going to at some point eat dinner or something, right? But, uh, but ultimately, our behavior is a little bit unpredictable, right? Because it's another being, right? So that's, that is, that, th those are the criteria for autonomy, right? And, um, and how to get there is going to be a combination of decentralization technology and AI. And, and, and this is actually a point that I've been, been trying to make. And I think there's, there's interesting reasons why, why it's not really a point that's out there already. But to me, decentralization and AI are very much like linked. Um, and it's, they're, it's funny because they feel like separate fields. Even though they're two computer science fields, it feels like socially and technologically they're different. You know, it's different people, different organizations, and, and different motivations. Uh, however, they're linked by, by the pursuit of one thing, um, automation. Right? So they're both trying to create mechanisms for automation. Um, but, but in slightly different ways, right? And the AI field, you know, the Googles and Facebooks and the Baidus of the world are trying to create intelligence. And the idea of intelligence is that you can create systems that act, uh, that, that, autom that are automated, that they don't, they, that they basically, you know, s subsume a lot of the human inputs and just kind of act independently, right? Um, and then the centralization space is trying to create software that can't be interfered with, 
that the, and that's and and to me those two things are necessarily linked because like if in if an AI company tells me that they've created an intelligent being that they can turn on or off I will tell them that it's not a being because it's not it's just software that they control it's not autonomous autonomous is to me it's like a fundamental necessity of of um, of an AI so that's why I actually think there's a lot that these two fields can gain from each other um, and that's actually basically the next slide, right? So AI refers to the auto automation of industry and commerce, you know, so your personal assistants, your duplexes, your self-driving cars, your um, websites that, that give you content on demand, right? That's, that's AI. And decentralization is basically reliable computation that can't be interfered with. And, and actually this governance thing, you can ignore it for now. We're, we're going to talk about this later, but... Um, but, but basically creating systems that, that, that are autonomous in the ways that we've been discussing. And so these two things are complementary. AI gives decentralization intelligence, right? Because, okay, you can think of like, we already have some decentralized systems. We have things like Bitcoin and we have mostly Bitcoin has been the only really, really useful one so far. But, um, but Bitcoin is really stupid. Like I, I shouldn't call it stupid. It's a very simple. It, all it is, is it's a program that, that has a bunch of accounts, users, and they, everyone has a number. And that number, we all interpret it as money. But like from a program standpoint, it's the simplest possible uh, program that has these properties, the decentralization properties. Um, but, it's, but, it doesn't, but it doesn't do anything very sophisticated. So AI gives, can, can give software sophistication can give it the ability to do things that are much more complex than, than just managing money or, or not even managing money, but just having money, like proving that you have money. Um, and on the other hand, decentralization gives AI autonomy, right? It gives the, if you create a, a, a being which exhibits behavior, intelligence on par with a human being, but also gives it autonomy, you know, like a conscious autonomy. Uh, and so this leads us to this idea of a decentralized AI, right? And um, if you make, if you talk about decentralized AI online, uh, it's it's pretty easy to get to get um, waved away because it's like two, it's a collision of buzzwords, right? It's a buzzword salad, decentralized, you know, like like it, it, like the wor the worst thing, even worse would be blockchain AI. Like if I. You know that would be even worse. And like there are tons of there are tons of really really um, like suspicious like um, things out there that are that are talking about blockchains and AI. And I, I can even show you some of them. That, and and you know so obviously like there is this buzzword salad. And so a, a thousand things that talk about decentralized AI are mostly just like trying to capitalize in the cachet of the words. But um, but there actually is. A tiny minority of that that's that's actually interested in this in this relationship, and uh, and I'll show you actually some of those projects uh, later. Um, so that's this notion of decentralized AI, and finally, the autonomous artificial artist is night is a decentralized AI whose mission is to create art, right? So it would be like if Bitcoin's purpose was to generate art rather than to um, transfer money around, right? So it's a decentralized organization in that sense. Yeah. Just, uh, a question about that last. Is who's the art for? Is it for mm. other autonomous artists, or is it for us, or is it for some other? Hmm. Um, it's a good question. It's not not necessarily clear. Like for me, I, I don't have any assumptions either way. Like you know, who does an artist make art for? Could be. Cons I mean, right now, artists make art for people, anyone that can can appreciate it, more or less. So I guess you could say for anyone that can appreciate it. Maybe in the future that is other art, artificial, uh, that is other autonomous artists, um, and, and actually like one thing like there's a nice quote um, on the internet. Oh, what's it like on the internet? No one cares if you're uh, what is it? A dog, right? And but also on the internet, no one cares if you're a computer program. So like you know, what is the difference between uh, a bot on Twitter and a person? Well, we, we make a big distinction, but on Twitter, that distinction doesn't really matter anymore if the bot can create content that, that, that is like a human, right? So in the future, we might have a lot of like, if you believe in the top, in the, the biggest promises of, of AI, 
that we're going to create beings which exhibit and that break the Turing test, that, that basically exhibit intelligence like us, then hey, why not make art for them? Like, you know, I mean, maybe you won't want to because, because I mean, this gets into all this philosophical stuff that maybe at some point we can discuss. Like, you know, are, are they zombies or are they actually like conscious, intelligent beings? This, the, these are problems that are unsolved, it seems. Um, so at that point, it becomes like up to you, right? Um, I, I'm interested in building the technology that enables it either way. So I don't want to take positions necessarily. Um, so, but who knows? Like maybe there will be many manifestations and some, some make the distinction and some don't. You know, I could imagine. Okay, um, and so now this is a good opportunity to maybe take a little break. And then when we come back, I'll, I'll, I'm basically going to review the, 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 um, like the stuff that we did last semester, like very quickly, just so for those of you who weren't part of the class, you'll you'll have a better under understanding of, um, of it. Um, yeah, okay, let's take a break and we'll be back in, you know, five, five or so minutes. Mm -hmm. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. That, that was already deeply terrifying. Yeah, I know, right? That's, <laughs> great. That's great. The goal is to terrify people. Jason and I had a lot of discussions about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad. That's that's. I'm trying to get people excited. We're a team. Yeah, great. Why aren't you more scared? I am scared, uh, but but you know, like you know, we have to confront our fears, right? Like uh, we have to confront them, and so that we can we can you know because these are these are things that are coming. So may, they may be the best thing in the world. They could be the worst thing in the world. It's kind of up to us, right? And they can create a different reality because our reality is really it's not the real reality. There are so many out there, and just can create a new reality which might be offer another form of truth. There you go. So this is that's worth it. even scarier. What he just said is the no, scariest because, thing like, ever. No, because you don't know. I mean, this that consciousness is, is not yours or mine. It's everybody's. It's like, yeah. or maybe nobody's. And. I, I, I long for the moment where, so if we have the machine out there in the front room, and then there is one moment, maybe one day here at ITP, where we just let it go. And it's just out there. <laughs> I hope so. And it's not, and then, then we destroy the computer, the physical one. Just, that's, that's the goal, right? So I like one day. <laughs> I mean, yeah, honestly, make a ceremony. I would like, like this very, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very, very into be, the idea oh of a ceremony. God. Like, the ceremonies and rituals, like, I very, very interesting. I'm going to program a little, like, kill switch in there, just blow it up. After you I love it. Yeah, blow it up. I'm super curious about the distributed learning. I yeah. wonder how we do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's so cool. That'll be like it's... week four, we'll, something like that. Week three or four, yeah. we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, because it's, I think it's strong. And you combine it with, or we combine it with stuff like, you, you remember CoinHive when they did the Coin Hive. browser that? base, browser base. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Never worked. but I mean, it worked, but it was never kind of like, you couldn't train really. But it was basically, you could do, I think, they were Bitcoin based, and you could basically mine uh, for validated transactions. You online. would just use someone else's and the browser. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So basically, like if they distributed the mining and said, like, we don't want this these farms, we just want to use the computers that people have. And there are many ideas out there, like for example, like for renderings, which take a lot of GPUs. They wanted to do that. Octane wanted to do distributed rendering. So yeah. Basically, a token based system. So you. You give the rendering power of, well, not of this machine because it can't really render well, but of a nice GPU, um, and you get a little bit of money, or like, not money, but kind of like Bitcoin for it, but it's decentralized, so everybody can make like a little bit of money on the side. I mean, it's like minimum account. Yeah, one of the one of the projects I'll probably mention, maybe not in the class, but on the Slack, uh, is, uh, you know, Electric Sheep? The, that was a project by... Um, New York actually like, uh, Scott Graves it's a project from like it's a good must be like 15 years ago or something it's a pretty old project um, but basically it's this it's kind of like CoinHive except it uses everyone's computer to make generative art so it's one of the first like distributed generative art projects so yeah and it's still running it just it's like a screensaver basically but it uses everyone's combined rendering power crowdsource evolving art okay Told me actually to learn about gold. But it's gold. It's probably the. Is that the. Ah, it's called Drax. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's my, it's like, what was the project? Yeah, I was in a, the, the search for extraterrestrial life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Was it S? Yeah. 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 That's right, yeah, same yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So you could uh, just uh, contribute your. your yeah. 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 No, no, no. Contribute your CDs. That's great. Well, Canada's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. I got back. Sweet. I got back. Uh, is it like the thing? Yeah. 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 I, I tried to do a little bit, break, but I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to do anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I rested, right? Ready to go hard. Actually, now I feel yeah. like I really have to... That's okay, that's okay. I feel the energy coming back, but I got to wait for later. I got to get back. Smart people. Well, we take it. Yeah. Taking this stuff, watch the people that you have to be choosing. Right before this, yeah. like, uh, yeah. taking like, the like, idea of class on the Brooklyn campus. Yeah, or they sound so even have the thing that they choose to be done. They're like, I don't know. I just want to check that it'll be okay for me because maybe like. Five, ten minutes later, class of Canada, depending on if I catch the right left train. Because it's literally like that class ends at 150, and this one's up at 12. Sprint for Metro Tech. Like it seems like did you take the girl stack? No. No. But I, I, I wanted to, but I couldn't. Like, like, yeah. 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 I'm looking forward to. I'm gonna watch all the way up to this. Yeah. I'm super interested, but that was really scary. Everything you just said. Yeah. Maybe one of this like. Yeah. I don't know. Stop all. Progress. Yeah. 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 Understand, and the only thing is, like, they don't have the money back to payment. So he had a million dollars in blockchain, so it's like the lottery almost. Like, they can't give him a whole lump sum because they don't have the ability to translate that money into something usable. But he's a blockchain billionaire. The new thing with this girl is you will pay for everything. Yeah. Yeah. Because blockchain conference yeah. and then yeah. yeah. ended up getting arrested for some shit. It was like crazy. It's crazy. That's the thing. Here, here, here. Pitching. I just wanted to double check because right before this class, the class actually. At IDM. I'm okay. So, um, like, I really want to do this class. I just think that, judging from what happened today, like, that might be like five ish to finish the each class. Is that an issue? No, it's not really an issue for me. Like, okay. you know, uh, and then I can always, like, uh, you know, especially if you're screen recording, like, you need, like, the first yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's not an issue. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. So, just wanted to give you a heads up. Yeah, yeah. So you want to kind of like look at them and then you try to come and like with a... I don't know, like... Because it's super cool because like at the end of the day, that's what I meant with it. It's kind of like... You can play the book and see how it's biased and it's Well, I think it's great a lot. I think it's great a lot. Like, I think maybe creating some. Speaking of young. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that this is going to improve, but like going more into this art. Oh. Not art. I'm deep in young. Yeah. This is the last book he wrote. Or. Are you? This is Alchemy. 
It's uh, psychoanalysis and alchemy put together. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's like very the problem very obscure analysis of alchemical symbols. Again, some of uh -huh. the like metaphors and consciousness and unconsciousness. This is his last. This, this is his last book. He he edited a book called Man and His Symbols, which is like for the layman yeah. before he died. But before that, there was a long period he didn't write anything, and this was the last book he wrote in his like sort of like career before like he was like pulled out oh, before he was like you know he returned to like write this last book. Yeah, so this is the last book in his like actual work. When did he? What, what, what year did it? Uh, probably like 50s, 60s, something like that. Uh, so. And then 1950s, all the way. I think he died like like 60 years ago. Really, that late? Yeah, it's been around for a while, I guess. I don't know about me so much, but I think it's. Oh, maybe you can go away, you know what? Just to fix the text. And then you get it in the next one, which you can do it. You know what? So it reads, it, it takes the, so this is a picture, so the, the means of the picture, but you want to expect that this is first going to work. Because if you can do it, otherwise. Right, and, right, I can. can yeah, the means. and then you can generate the text and run an image from But I can also, yeah, I can also. And use the image, so you have to do, you have a bunch of text generation process, and you have the image generation process, and then you mix it together. Okay. Okay. So you separate it first, so it's better if you can. And then you right. put it better and put it together. Yeah. Actually, you can do that. You can For me, the thing is about, because I didn't collect this data, so like, it's not around. But can you go backwards? Twitter, you can go back. I think the, the limit is 10,000. 10, I, I wrote, yeah, so, so Twitter's, yeah. I did Twitter scraping in summers. For, you can do like a lot. I think it's just like, so you can do just like, and it's like Twitter is like not, they don't sue you. That's good. I think it's cool. I think, I think no, no. But anyways, but speak your genius. But it's definitely really good. I think it's a great, it's a great idea. I really like it because it's very, it's open ended. You just give it all of your hands. You say like, okay, I get this data, all of the data. This is what it makes. It makes whatever stuff. Do you think this is what this was the unconscious? This was the consciousness of people at that time. I don't. I try I to be unbiased. Interesting to compare to you know, like to get specific words like yeah, the um, and and then compare to people like like unconscious like before the election and then now like according like to maybe like the um. Like in, in different aspects of the like abortion. Yeah, you can. Um, I can. I can. Yeah. 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 I think it's cool. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
a man is swinging a golf club, something like that. Yeah. Ah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, that's enough. It doesn't need to be super accurate. It yeah. just needs to do the job. And I think with frames, I can do it, but it's, it's difficult. Yeah. Because there, um, there is actually, uh, like, I've seen work on that, but I, I don't know, like, I, I don't know the repositories of him. But, but yeah. Good point. Let's just go through what we've seen. Okay, I want to maybe... Is, are there there's still some people missing? A lot of people. Okay, I think we should. Uh, we should start. Yeah. So uh, I'll slowly slowly gather everybody back back inside. Um, so I realized something. I did something very silly. Um, I talked about doing introductions, and then then we forgot to do introductions. So let's do that. Uh, I want to maybe like. Go around the room and and uh, just introduce yourself. This will help me uh, get to know each of you a little better, what you're interested in, and how you might be able to kind of uh, contribute to the to the to the piece. And um, so basically, just tell me like your name and what else can we make part of the part of it. Like we can say your name, your maybe what you're doing at SP, like what you're what you're working on, um, and uh, I guess it's. Do people have, everyone here is, is a second year, right? Is that correct? Oh, we have oh, uh, some, some first years? Okay. Um, for those of you who are second years, if you already have an idea of what your like, like final project is, um, mention that. I'm just curious. Because like, it'll tell me just like what you're, what you're interested in, right? Um, okay, let's start to my left. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Jesse. Mm -hmm. I'm a second year. And uh, I was in the neural aesthetic last semester. Really enjoyed it. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail, but for my thesis idea, I'm looking at exploring different aspects of memory, both like computer memory and human memory, and sort of exploring uh, ways to represent that. I'm Roland. Uh, I have a passion for machine learning uh, and. Thanks to Gene, I'm actually probably here <laughs> because I went to a class uh, with him two years ago here at ITP Camp, um, and then I totally got hooked and it's like, okay, this is what I want to do. So for my thesis, I, I will definitely focus on machine learning, uh, but machine learning is a tool for uh, creating something spiritual, creating a spiritual object, creating spiritual actions, um, and use some sort of artificial spirit to um, foster them. Yeah, so that's the goal. It's up in the air, but we're going to see. Uh, I'm Ilona. Um, I've been doing my at ITP making work on augmented reality, so doing some storytelling experiences like geolocation, uh, one of the labs I have to do with my girlfriend, and I'm excited to like, go deeper into machine learning. I've experimented a bit. Um, yeah, for my thesis, I'm still like debating on what to do, if I should go like with AR, which I'm more comfortable with, or maybe experiment with some of these new skills on the box. Uh, my name is Azalea. I'm the second year. Um, I've been doing a lot of stuff on ITP, but um, in the past like year or so, um, I started getting into kind of like artificial artists, like basically. So like um, last year, I was trying to basically kind of create like a program that would be able to uh, like draw a portraiture. Um, and um, I actually had, was in uh, Yinning's class, machine learning for the web, and I started playing around with pix to pix and like was able to train a model on Kandinsky's art and then allow people to be able to like draw like in his style or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's kind of mainly been my contribution. But like for thesis, I'm kind of like, um, I kind of started exploring, um, I guess, uh, just like movement and how you can capture movement um, and quantify movement. I read about um, Rudolf Laban's um, like notation of choreography, basically, and that kind of inspired me to think about movement differently. Um, yeah, and motion and things like that. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm uh, second year as well. I I don't know what I'm going to do in my thesis. Uh, before that, I made some. I made a lot of things. I don't know how to describe them. <laughs> 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 they are different from 
we should add there. So uh, I, I like machine learning, and I think I will do something with machine learning for my thesis. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm a second year also. Um, so for my thesis, I'm interested in um, storytelling, like telling people's stories for the future generations. Um, and I'm thinking somehow of um, using artificial intelligence or machine learning to like take my data, like I would download or extract my data from Facebook and like have it like kind of learn like um, my like behavior and stuff and somehow like create a story based on that. Cool. Um, I'm Michael. I was in uh, Jim's class last semester and I said it. And um, for my thesis, um, I'm planning on, I think, using machine learning in the NFP pipeline um, for a web app and hopefully an electron app as well. And um, for the purposes of this class, I understand it's a heavy theoretical slant, which I'm like an open creator that I've got from the humanities, but I'm also really interested in um, training uh, agents uh, in video games like beyond just behavior trees um, and letting them run loose sort of. Uh, and also, I'm not sure if this is appropriate for it, but I'm also really interested in uh, like modular synthesizers and maybe uh, working with plugins for those for virtual modular synthesizer environments. So um, I think those are my uh, interests. Cool. Uh, I'm Adrian. I'm a first year ITP. Uh, my background was actually in software before, but not so much stuff. Uh, but I've been going to the meetups though, which I really enjoy. And uh, I'm also very interested in kind of the human bot interaction. Like my, my final project last semester it came out as a chat bot that was connected to the internet. So I'm interested in that. So. Cool. <clears throat> I'm Gong Kyo, and I took uh, your aesthetic last semester. And now I'm fascinated with machine learning. So for my thesis, I want to explore the human AI co-creativity. So I'm thinking of making a sort of uh, human AI uh, collaborated uh, content creation system. So from the I expect to get something like uh, machine generated web webcam or something. So I want to make something that consumable
Mm-hmm. What did you say your name was? I think it's Effie. Effie. Okay. You're, you're on the waiting list, right? Okay. Hey, I'm Jason, <clears throat> second year. Um, I'm mostly, I focus on like light art and using like LEDs and stuff, but I'm not really sure like that I'm gonna incorporate like machine learning into it, but my interest in taking this class is I'm just really interested in learning more about it. I'm also deeply terrified of machine learning, as you know, and um, I'm also really into Carl Jung and like Jungian psychology, so. <laughs> okay, so I understand, okay. And hey, Building an interactive children's book for my thesis, and it's using the um, uh, machine learning stuff. And I also took a uh, neural study last semester. Uh, Will, um, you have me from the second year. Um, and for the thesis, I'm like kind of all over the place, but I'm like based on like interested in interoperability. Is that the term? Like, um, Your, uh, what was your name again? Aaron, but not Aaron. Oh, what was it? Oh, uh, yeah, from email. Oh, okay. Oh, you're right. Right, right, right. How do you pronounce it? Naira? Naira? Naira or Aaron. Naira. Yeah. Or, or Aaron. Yeah, on my email it says that because that's like my artist name, but uh -huh. I'm, I'm like, I don't know. Uh -huh. what, you know, what would you prefer? into the performative and the expressive aspects of uh, machine learning. And I'm actually working on a, a project to be 
shown uh, on the lesson show in this late May, and I want to combine uh, the machine learning with, uh, with some other solutions together. So I'm um, thinking that. Okay, cool. Thanks, Eric. Uh, is there anyone else coming? Oh, yeah. I'm Anna. I'm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I've done most of my work in AR and uh, I'm like telling stories about women in Pakistan and Hong Kong. Mm. And I just want to learn more about machine learning and see how I can apply it. Did I say it right? Amina? Um, okay, is there anyone who came in late? I think, I think we got everybody. Um, okay, cool. So a full, what is it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight? I think eight people from neural aesthetics, so, all right. <laughs> um, okay, cool, well, let's get, let's get back to it. So that'll kind of help me kind of digest a little bit about the collective interests of, of here. We'll kind of, um, and yeah, and hopefully I'll get to know everybody like within the week, I think, next week. Okay, uh, so now let's talk about the neural aesthetic. So this is the course that um, a handful of you took with me last semester, and and some of you have taken. Like Roland, you've gotten you've gotten most of it from from other classes, and um, a lot of the stuff that we're doing uh, bootstraps a little bit off of some of the things that we did in this class. So I'm going to kind of like review some of it. Um, don't worry, you don't have to like take the whole retake the whole class or anything like that. We're gonna we're gonna re do everything from scratch. Although it's definitely like uh, for preparation's sake is super helpful. So if you have the time, it's early in the semester, so there's not too much homework. So maybe you might be able to to watch some of these videos. Hopefully they're entertaining. You know, you'll get to see a lot of pretty pictures, a lot of general model stuff. Um, and um, so yeah, all of that stuff is here. I'm gonna do kind of a light review, like like a really just brief review of some of the components, it's especially the ones that are gonna be relevant to us here. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of fly through the introductory stuff, um, but basically this course was all about, uh, let me just see how we're doing in time, it's 1.50 and we have until 2.40, okay, so we have 15 minutes, not, not too bad. Okay, so this, this class was all about machine learning and creativity in art, right, and of course like we mentioned deep learning is all the rage these days, but most of the stuff, most of the excitement is really all about, you know, um, uh, industrial, commercial applications. But it turns out that there's this emerging area of machine learning used for the kind of stuff that we're interested in here. And not just art, but, but like just creativity in general and also in, in design of in, interaction design and uh, design more generally, right? And machine learning affects it's seemingly everything, right? So it, it has a, an application to almost anything you can think of. And so this class kind of focused on the ones that were relevant to us at ITP. We talked about a lot of interactive and real-time stuff. Um, so that was kind of the early part of the course was all about um, using things like Weckinator and uh, processing and P5 to create interactive scenarios that made use of machine learning in some sense. And then the, um, the, the second module of the class was generative models, which is um, they're not exactly mutually exclusive. Like you can have generative models that are interactive and that's actually gonna be the goal for us or a goal. Um, but they were, but it was somewhat of a separate module in that it used different technology. It involved uh, a little bit more like down low computer uh, science kind of stuff, and um, and so it made sense to make it make it a second module. I, we're we're going to kind of start with generative models, but uh, but definitely interactivity stuff is going to be, I think, a layer on top. Of, like I imagine having a generative model that we interact with. That's kind of like. Maybe the core of the of the um, the autonomous artist, uh, and then there were a number of special topics like that were unrelated to either of those. Like we talked a little bit about reinforcement learning, and we talked about natural language processing. Um, most of those special topics will probably not be uh, reinforcement learning. Might might actually be very uh, very useful, and uh, Aiden is probably the uh, the the most advanced in that area, so that might actually become very very handy. Um, but it's probably not something we're going to cover in too much detail in this class, like reinforcement learning. 
Um, and so, yeah, let me, let me kind of take you through a deep dive. So, you know, not to be too pedantic, but to do like from the beginning, like machine learning. What is machine learning? Machine learning ultimately, like you can boil it down to this, is a, an approach to solving problems in AI. Um, and it, and as, as um, distinguished from other kinds of uh, AI that isn't machine learning, the, the core thing that's there is data. Right, learning from data, um, because in AI, AI might refer to other techniques. Uh, in some sense, AI has become almost an obsolete term. So, like in the nineteen forties and fifties, AI meant basically what we mean by computer science today. So it used to be that AI meant, you know, making computers, like computers that did things, like like sorting objects and solving mazes, was considered AI. And then at some point, once people got used to computers doing that, they decided that wasn't AI anymore, right? So AI is this moving target. It's always this vanishing sort of like horizon. Um, there's, uh, this is called the AI effect sometimes. Um, so AI is more or less, I think the best definition for AI is AI is anything that computers can't do yet. Um, or, or, or another one is, uh, this is related to the, my, my favorite definition of technology. Technology is anything that was invented after you were born. Right. So that's my favorite definition of technology. Very, very uh, it's similar to the AI horizon. Um, and, but the contrast with machine learning to previous a AI um, is that it's, it, it doesn't use so-called expert systems, right? Which is to say, like, it doesn't, it assumes kind of a blank slate, right? It assumes that um, you can create algorithms that learn from data with no prior assumptions about the structure of that data. It kind of learns the structure in the process of, of just observing the data. And so essentially, like from a mathematical standpoint, it's fitting functions. And everyone did some machine learning, like even if, you, if you've ever taken a, like, um, like a high school statistics course, let's say, or, or, um, or even like, like 12th grade math, let's say, you probably learned about fitting lines, right? Lin you did linear regression. You would get a bunch of points and you would be asked to find the line of best fit. So that's machine learning. That's basically taking, learning a function from data. So really, really simple machine learning, but it's machine learning nonetheless. And, and ultimately, X is like a data set and F is a function that takes the data set and maps it to some, some uh, output. And that output is what we're trying to model. We're trying to, like, we're trying to model some sort of a, like a relationship between data and function, functionality, right? So like, for example, oh, I'll, I'll have a, I have a few examples coming up, but just to mention like machine learning is the zeitgeist. Yeah, so like it seems like it's everywhere. I mean, um, like, I mean, there's tons of, obviously like there's tons of investment and there's tons of startups and there's just all of the classes are, not to sound pretentious, but like the first time I took machine learning, it was like, it was, a, it was like, um, you know, maybe uh, a, like it was a, uh, a college class that had like 20 people in it, right? Now it's like any introductory machine learning classes at universities, like, okay, if you go to the computer science introduction, you know, department at NYU, I'm sure it's going to be like an auditorium. So it's really something that's come along in, in, in just the last few years and largely driven by um, by multiple things that are kind of counter interacting with each other. So one is that there were some major advancements made starting around 2000, depending on where you start to count it, like advancements that go back actually like 20, 30 years, but really only started to work in an applied level in 2012, roughly. Like, so really quite recent, you know, everybody remembers 2012. Uh, so it's, so it, it's really in recent memory that this stuff started to work. And because of that, there's been a huge investment boom um, and that has then fed back into academia. Now there's just lots of people interested in academia. And of course, like it, ICP was never the sort of place that would have machine learning classes, right? Like if you go back 10 years and now, but now there's interest in machine learning pretty much in every domain. And so, um, it's the zeitgeist yeah, these days. And then, you know, blockchain is this other zeitgeist. So now we've got like two zeitgeists, you know, sort of comp competing. Um, a, a lot of a lot of this is also, I think, and this is kind of underrated, but a lot of the engagement from the public with machine learning has, I think, been very much 
um, has, has been very much influenced by the proliferation of a lot of openness, like in in the field. So now there's uh, there's very very powerful deep learning libraries that are open source, and so the researchers and all of us are using the same tools essentially. Um, these are really powerful libraries that are that are completely available online, and so it's become a lot easier to. Um, to to actually pursue you know very high level scientific research. So that's not to say it's as easy as it is you know uh, for a research institution, but it's a but the gap has been narrowed a lot, um, and so that's been really really I think has been really really great. The field is much more open now in general than it used to be. Obviously, like there's uh, there's really really like excellent um, machine learning classes online. Um, like introduction to you know introduction to machine learning and Coursera and Udacity and all these, so it's possible to take these like graduate level courses online. Um, all of the research in com in computer science generally and machine learning especially um, is by now it's completely open access. There's zero publishing in 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 uh, paywall things in journals and so on. Everything is online archive.org. All the research you can people usually publish an archive before they even submit to conferences so you so it's, it's really it's really like that's a huge change in academia um, and uh, and then you have things like Kaggle which is like a like a for hire data scientist platform you know things like that and there and a lot of the researchers and the you know researchers let's say under the age of 40 are on, on Twitter like all of the all of the really really known like not all of them but a lot of the machine learning researchers they're they're discussing things online so it's actually possible to like you know there there's open dialogue on the internet right and that's f completely different from again like 2008 if you wanted to do machine learning there was almost no way to do it feasibly except within a graduate computer science program going to conferences you know, using MATLAB with its expensive licenses and, and, you know, reading research papers inside of journals and get and buying software. So, like, all of those things have been completely um, smashed. So, and not now, now there are, there's, there is trouble at bay. You know, it's not like everything is rosy. But, um, but definitely the openness is actually, like, uh, I think has been a big change from, from 10 years ago. Okay, so machine learning, supervised learning, let's call it, um, kind of fits this paradigm. You have some function which is mapping uh, some usually high dimensional data like X, let's call it X. X could be images, it could be text, it could be sound, it can be columns of data from a spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet, and Y is something that you're trying to predict from X. So maybe you're trying to predict the price of a stock based on the tweets about that, that company that day. So X is your tweets about that company, Y is your stock price, right? Or maybe Y is the price of a house, or maybe Y is the category of an object inside of an image, right? Is it a dog or a cat? Um, and so F is some magical function that takes in an input vector, X, and gives you a prediction for Y. Right, um, and we won't get too much into the mathematical mechanics of that. That we did, we did do that to some degree in neural aesthetics. So if you're interested in that, you can find it there. Um, but but that's is essentially the way you can think of it. And the way that f is found is that f is learned. Right. So initially, we instantiate in a random f. Right. F is some high um, some parametric function with possibly hundreds of millions of parameters and those parameters are initially randomized and then we take a learning algorithm and we feed a training set of known XY pairs we feed it to the learning algorithm and the learning algorithm figures out what those parameters should be to make F as accurate as possible. Um, so that's that's the basic idea and I'll show you some examples. Uh, well first of all this is this is like actually like more concretely how that works, the, the algorithm in question is generally speaking almost always gradient descent. Mm -hmm. um, there are experimental um, like approaches to training your neural networks that don't involve gradient descent that, that are in the research, but we won't really talk about them. Almost always it's gradient descent, um, which and found via a process called backpropagation. So if you're interested in what those are, 
Um, the third, I believe the third lecture of neural aesthetic was, was called How Neural Networks Are Trained. It's all about that. And it's very much like, it's beyond our scope. We don't really need it for this class. But um, again, it's like very, like, it's the central research question in machine learning. So it's, it's, it's a great thing to, to understand. Um, and it's also just a, a, a amazing to, to understand because, you know, this process of like how a bunch of pixels are said, you know, a computer says that's a cat. Uh, it seems like magic, but then it turns out that it's, it's math. You know, it's, it's actually like, and it's actually, believe it or not, and I, I know this, this sounds facetious, but it's totally, um, the math is actually straightforward. Quantum mechanics has, has very, very complex math, but a neural network has nothing more than addition, multiplication, and max, maximum, max of x and y. Um, that's all a neural network is. It's just that there's a hundred million of those, you know, basically. So it's like really, really fun, simple math, but uh, in a gigantic structure where it's happening a lot. That's why we use computers because it's, you know, really fast. Um, and and so it's, it's actually like relatively simple, but, but quite... Um, but uh, mathematically speaking, but, but it has emergent phenomena, right? So it's like emergent properties. It's generative, basically. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of worth knowing. Some applications of machine learning, image classification, you know, this is a dog, not a cat or a piano. You could do image regression also, which is like how much rain is in this image, you know? And it's a, the difference between classification and regression is that classification is categories and you pick one there there's no order to them and then regression is is a continuous value right so like what is the stock price you know there's a it's, it's a value that, that it's not discrete right? that's the that's the difference between regression and classification um, you can have classification of not just images but text you know so sentiment analysis is this task in natural language processing that takes a sentence or a paragraph or, you know, some text and classifies the sort of emotion or the sentiment of it, right? So this is, this is an angry Yelp review or something like that, right? Um, you could do also, also like sound classification is, is um, for example, um, the uh, speech to text is sound classification. So it maps audio to a word. So, so those are all, those are all examples of classification. Um, now, x and y can be very, very uh, complicated. Like, like people can, uh, and and we usually learn about x being complicated. Like, x is an image. It can be a sound. It can be text. But it turns out that y also can be complicated. Y can, y doesn't just have to be a label, or a val, or a, or a slider. It can be a whole other image. It can be a whole other sound. It could be text itself, right? So, for example, when you hear about style transfer, that's a function that converts one image into another kind of image, right? Um, and uh, and so we talked about this a lot in neural aesthetic. And generative models are essentially our uh, our neural networks where y is some complicated artifact. You know, y is a sound or an image or or text or something that we want to generate and, and look at. Um, image text, so uh, Y can be as complicated as a sentence describing an image, right? Um, so a group of giraffes standing next to each other. Um, this is this is one of the I, this is I am text is one of the text flow models that we'll use inside of Runway. Uh, we should be able to look at that maybe maybe next week I think. Um, and then um, and okay, so then a little bit more concretely, like what is this magical F that we keep on mentioning, right? That we keep on looking at. And F is basically, um, it's so strange, like the mouse is over top of some slides, but then disappears over others. It's like, does, does anyone know how Keynote decides like to do that? It's, it's actually slide dependent. It's always on this slide. Oh, that might be. Maybe that's the... There's another link somewhere where I want to... Yes! You discovered the secret. I was... I must have asked about that like like 16 times in the, in the aesthetic, right? Like I was always... Like I need to put a link into every one because now I... Because I, I always... I love using the mouse. 
Whoa. So <laughs> that's totally it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like a small, like invisible link. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, so then, so what is this F? So F is a neural network, and and the and and again, like I, I will have to defer to the neural aesthetic just because you know there's really not enough time. Uh, but F is basically it looks kind of like this. It's like a, it's this collection of what we call neurons that are connected by these connections, right? And they and generally speaking, they go from you know they they go from left to right, right? They um, you have an input which is going to be some number of input values, and here there's two, right? There's just two values, x1 and x2, but, but x can be huge. It could be a whole image. It could be the pixels of an image. So images can have millions of pixels, right? So you can have millions of inputs potentially. Usually you don't have millions. They're usually downsampled. Like, it's very typical to see images um, downsampled to, like, you know, uh, like a few thousand pixels, let's say. Um, but... Um, but yeah, it, it's unbounded. And then it'll go through multiple layers of transformation. So that you'll have layers of neurons, and the data kind of is transformed at each layer. So you go from the leftmost layer to the next layer, and you get in each layer a representation of the data, which is increasingly more and more high level. Like it's, it's learning information as it goes. And it goes from learning simple information to more, getting more complicated information. Um, I'm going to show you a demo in a few slides that'll that'll make this a little more concrete. But the idea is these connections they're doing nothing but adding and multiplying numbers together. And um, these three circles in the middle they have some values, right? And we call those uh, that's a hit, that's a layer of neurons, and it's it has some representation of x, which has been learned, you know, has been transformed uh, through these connections. Something like that. I know it's a little bit abstract, but you'll see something more concrete in a moment. Now, uh, like, this is a really simple neural network, and it is, in fact, a neural network. A more complicated neural network that you might see a diagram looks like this. And the reason why you don't see the neurons anymore is because the, there's, like, tens of millions of them. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of hard to display. Um, and, and also, the connections between them might also become a little bit more complicated. So you start to see things like conv and max and, and full. Um, conv stands for convolution. And I'm actually, um, we probably won't really look at it in detail. Again, like in the first two lessons of the neural aesthetic are, are you know, how it works, basically. Um, but basically, co uh, convolutional layers are just a type of a way of transforming the information in, in one layer into the next layer. Uh, and, and, and basically, what they're doing is they're looking for patterns. That's the best, that's the best way of thinking about it. Like, you're finding patterns in the data. And convolutional layers are a way of, of detecting those patterns. And uh, fully just means fully connected, means uh, no convolution, but, but okay. That's, that's kind of like TMI right now. Um, so yeah, neural networks can be increasingly complicated and large, but they essentially, you know, like, like zooming out, they do something like this. You have a dog, an image of a dog. All of its pixels go into the leftmost layer. They go through these connections. They flow through these connections. Um, to another set of neurons and are you know attenuated or multi you know multiplied and added together you get some new values and at the end you have some classification layer that gives you a classification of of uh, what that is it's a dog right um, and well, what do I want to say oh yeah uh, a nice metaphor that I like to sometimes use is um, think of it like this. Um, I can use two similar metaphors that, that are kind of similar. One is an electrical circuit where um, each of these nodes are connected by metal wires, right? And so you have a signal that flows from one node to the next node. And, but then the, the uh, connection, the wire, you can control the resistance on it. And if you have a higher amount of resistance, then less of the current will make it to the next node. You have a lower resistance, more of the current makes the next node, right? Then you have many of these connections. And, and like one, I can't, there's no mouse here, but imagine the middle top neuron, right? It's, it's, it has a bunch of connections coming to it. So what it does is it sums up the current from all of them. It sums it together, right? So if you um, modulate the resistance on each, of those, on each of those wires, you get a different amount of current in that node, right? 
And the goal of learning is figuring out what the resistance should be in each of those wires, right? To get the right values at each stage. Uh, both questions, yeah? Are you first? Is this the same as like features in data science? Yes, uh, features are, the, uh, are what are found from these pattern detectors, right? Your features, patterns, yeah, absolutely. No. What what is a neuron like? Is it this name like a neuron or? Yeah, it, it, the whole like neuron and neural network stuff is basically a holdover from um, from when these things were first named. They're they're very much inspired by the brain, right? So like when we were first trying to figure out how to do artificial intelligence, we were inspired by the only thing that we knew that could do intelligence at all, which is a brain. Um, and so the way what we knew about our brains is like very roughly speaking we have brains are made up of neurons that are connected by uh, What is it axons and synapses? Maybe someone here has a neuroscience background anyone here have a neuroscience background? No, okay good Because um, <laughs> if someone would be here it's like um, I, I actually in college like all of my roommates are neuroscientists Like in my last year of college so like my really good friends are neuroscientists so it's like I can't you know it's just I butcher the whole thing. Uh, but anyway, uh, but neuroscience is super interesting anyway. But, but anyway, anyhow, like neuroscience, like we were modeling essentially a brain because we know that the way that it, you know, you get some, so okay, like this is a huge simplification of how your visual system works, right? You have a bunch of, your retina in your eye has a bunch of these neurons that are like barely, barely exposed. You know, they're, they're like, they're right here. They're, they're just barely, they're just, and they're sensitive to light. And so they get a signal and then they send that signal. They send those signals to neurons farther in, into your, into your skull, basically, that collect those signals and add them together and then fire them to another, another set of neurons. And there is actually some evidence of layering in the visual system. The brain is not so neatly ordered as a neural network because, you know, we have these beautiful layers because it's very convenient for computers, basically, but the brain is much more dynamic. Um, so, th and that's kind of the story. Like, we, we were inspired by the brain and we made a really basic brain-like brain -like structure. However, there's a bunch of simplifying assumptions that, and, and at some point, the field of machine learning, it was kind of divorced from, from you know, neuroscience. There is another field called computational neuroscience, which is, which is kind of still concerned with using computers to model the brain like more authentically um, or more faithfully to what a brain is actually like. But, um, but machine learning kind of proceeds, you know, it's just results oriented. You know, so, but okay, you can see there's some commonality with the brain, so neurons are, you know, similar. Uh, there, uh, you also have a question? Or? Oh, no, you asked there. And uh, you, uh, oh, you had the same question, or it's like neurons about neurons? Okay, yeah. We'll continue. <laughs> so um, another analogy, instead of signal, uh, electrical signals, is water. You, almost those connections are pipes, and you can kind of make the pipe more narrow or more wide. And training, the, as we say, training or learning, is finding the right resistances or the right pipe sizes or whatever. In order to get, um, in order to get the right results on the on the other side, and it's very very dynamic, right? Because if you change, for example, I can't move the mouse. Imagine just one random line in there, in the first layer. If you change it, then you change the values flowing for all of the connections in the next layer. So so it's a very the connections are all very interdependent. It's a highly nonlinear function, right? Um, so that's that's kind of what gives it its what gives it the dynamics, right? You can you can model essentially any arbitrary function, like like any function that can be shaped, any existing function can be captured, can be modeled by a neural network given the right values for those connections. So any shape, literally any shape, um, and of course, that's an infinite space. But usually we're looking for like one, you know, particular one that works well, that's accurate. Accurate means has lowest amount of loss, the lowest amount of error on the training set. Um, now this process of training um, may look something like this, right? So you start giving your, you instantiate a neural network and it's random, 
These connection, these are the visualization of the of the actual parameters, the connections, the weights, as we call them. And so it's randomized. And what happens is we start to feed it data. You know, we give it examples of numbers and we tell them what those numbers are. And gradually it changes the weights to get a higher and higher accuracy. And the weights themselves carry can can be interpreted. You can kind of see the impressions of the numbers in there, right? So you kind of see there's a relationship there. These, um, these weights actually are telling us what the patterns are. We are actually discovering the patterns, right? We don't specify them. We actually discover them in the process of learning. Um, so let me do a quick demo. Again, let me just check how we're doing in time. 17. I think we're okay. I'll do, I'll do a very quick uh, yeah, okay, let, let's, let's do a, oh wait, do I even have a demo here? <laughs> Calvinet viewer, yes I do. Alright, let's, let's, let's really quickly pull this up. So like, this is a neural network that's running live in the, uh, yeah, in the computer. And so, like, what happens is, you have these layers of connections. And so you start with some input image, you know, the webcam stream, and there's a bunch of, patterns that we're looking for in the first layer and they look kind of like this and these are the results of all of those patterns and it's bright where a particular pattern is present is located right and so the, all of these they look similar you can see me in there but they're all basically like the result of trying to find a, a specific pattern in that image now the first thing you might be thinking of why those patterns was that your question like where did these patterns come from Oh no. How every individual image is related to the image that you showed us earlier, but the neurons and the connected by the lines and stuff. Yeah. So are these like circles or like the lines? Oh, oh good, good, that's a good question. Um, these are the circles. These are the neurons. You can um, now the thing is like it won't make sense if you just from this, right? Uh, sorry, sorry. It won't make sense just from this because. Um, because these are fully connected layers. But in a type of layer called the convolutional layer, the, these circles kind of remain intact in the, in the shape of the image. Like, just think of it that way. So, and yeah, in the connections, the, the lines are, oops, are these. Um, and just visualize where um, they're in color because you can, have, you can have the connections referred to, like stand for a particular channel, you know, red, green, blue. Uh, but but they can also be not red, green, blue, as you'll see in a moment. But well, okay, I'm the TTMA. Uh, so so these are the, the the activation maps, as we call them sometimes. So these are this is the amount of those patterns in the image, and so it goes through this process of multiple layers of transformations, right? It goes through sometimes what are called pooling layers, which condense the information, and then what happens is we take all of these and we combine them into a new representation of that image. So like imagine all of these things you're looking at, you can kind of see me in there, right? And you can vaguely interpret this as like the presence of a particular small multiple pixel pattern in every spatial location in the image. So there's many of them, right? There's 96 in fact right here. And so you imagine taking all of these and we stick them together into a big volume of data. Like it's, it's imagine a new image except the image I'm putting quotation marks around it. it. Instead of having a red, green, and a blue channel, it has 96 channels, and each channel corresponds to the presence of a particular kind, uh, particular feature. Right. So it's kind of a more informative version of the input. Right. It's like the input is just bare color pixels. Right. And the the output is like the presence of these uh, what would you call it? Like presence of these patterns. And so what happens is, it goes through another convolution where we take patterns from those patterns. This is the, this is the key mind-blowing part. Like, you, find it, you found some patterns in the first layer, and in the second layer, you find patterns from the patterns that were found in the first layer. Patterns of patterns. So if you give it the opportunity to find patterns of patterns, you're giving it the opportunity to find more complex features. So in, in the beginning, you find simple features, edges, basically, edges, lines, you know. In the second layer, you find corners or crosses or parallel lines, you know, basically 
patterns of patterns. In the third layer, you'll find, you know, basic shapes, hexagons, lattices, grids, you know, like um, basic shapes, basically. In the next layer, you'll find even more complicated shapes. In the next layer, you'll find basically, like, you'll start to get basic objects, windows, doors, um, tables, you know, socks, things, that, you know. And then you'll get even more complicated objects in the next layer, you know, cars, buildings, um, you know, furniture, th things of that sort. So it's basically this process of, 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 of finding features at each layer that are becoming increasingly complicated and hard to interpret. However, some of these are, are actually quite interpretable. Everyone here uh, who took the neuron aesthetic, does that, anyone here remember the number of my favorite neuron? I'm really curious if anyone. <laughs> Which one? Anybody? I was, I was hoping one person would. It's 156. So here's CON4 156. That's my face detector. Right? Okay, see? <laughs> Actually, there's probably multiple face detectors that are slightly different. Um, and what's interesting is that the, it wasn't like the network was programmed to detect faces. It was programmed to detect objects in ImageNet. Uh, dogs, cats, mostly dogs, um, and, you know, uh, other objects, buses, things like that. And in the process of training that network, it learned that things, uh, it's useful to detect faces along the way because finding faces helps you tell apart uh, classes that have faces and classes that don't have faces. And, you know, fa cats and dogs and humans have faces, but buses don't. Right, so, so it finds features that are useful for the task of classification, categorization, or discrimination, it's called. So then, finally, at the end, we can do classification. Right, so this is a suit, or a bow tie, yeah. Or, dumbbell, <laughs> I, iPod, iPod, there's my iPod, yeah. <laughs> stupid, stupid neural network, it's an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly, yeah. 2014, actually, but, but even still. You know. so, um, so, yeah, so it does it pretty well. So let's continue with the slides. Okay, so some things that we learned how to do in the neural aesthetic, like basic applications of these, you can do things like reverse image search, so finding the most similar image to a query image. You know, so you have pictures of frogs, and you get nearest looking frog, okay? Zebras, find me other zebras. So you can do this kind of analysis that lets you get similar, that lets you evaluate the similarity of two images, or two data points in general. And the similarity is not a superficial similarity, like color distribution, but it actually like, like um, you know, other pictures of zebras, right? So there's no pictures of, of uh, what, what else is black and white? So, um Newspapers, sorry? What was that? Skunks, yeah, there's no pictures of skunks here, right? Even though from a color similarity perspective, it might be very similar to this picture of a zebras, right? But it only finds out other zebras because it's based on those features that are found in the neural network, right? So that's reverse image search. You can use, very, you can, it's, it's related to another task, which is like shortest path between images. Maybe some of you are familiar with Mario Klingemann's, um, Mario Klingemann has this installation called X Degrees of Separation. Mm -hmm. So you find the, a path through image space that kind of like has short transitions. So you can go from a scorpion to a boat via an alligator, and a, you know, or, or I love the, the um, so that you go from like, so look, look at that, so that's this is good. the piano, piano to chair, to, to like a chair with wheels, to a wheelchair, to a motorcycle, right? so you can go from from a piano to a motorcycle via wheelchair, or from a yin yang <laughs> to a panda bear via a soccer ball. I really like that. Um, or from the Buddha statue to a dinosaur. <laughs> so so that's kind of a neat thing. I have no. By the way, ML Frey contains notebooks for how to do this. So there's re, uh, materials for how to actually do that stuff. TSNE is another technique we used for data visualization. It's really hard to see here, but these are these images are of similar things. So there's like starfish and whales, dogs, 
um, flowers. It's a little hard to see, but basically all of the images are sorted or, or arranged so that similar images are neighbors. You can do the same thing with audio. So this is a little demo that I had. I think maybe I can even... Um, audio TC. Oh, it's not working. I think the files have been flipped. Okay, the point is you can do it with audio. Um, you can also do it with text. So this is like visualizing. There's a new notebook, actually, and I'm afraid since the class ended, actually, this is new. Um, and uh, that shows you how to do this. Uh, a guide on how to create a TSNI of articles of text. So, you know, all the nationalism articles are clustered together, all the, all the anarchism cluster, uh, clustered together. So this is a cool way of analyzing a huge corpus of text. Mm. Um, word vectors, you've probably, maybe some of you have seen like things like Word2Vec, that's, ML5 has, has Word2Vec stuff. So that's like um, embedding words in the space where, where the relationship between words are, are actually vectorized, right? So there's like a gender vector inside of Word2Vec, right? That goes from king to queen and man to woman, or verb tense vector, walking to walk, swimming to swim, country capitals. There's all this like really cool um, stuff that you can do with words. And, and actually, not just with words, but in fact, entire sentences and paragraphs. Um, you can embed um, text of any size into into um, into vector space. Uh, we did a bunch of stuff in neural aesthetic on interactive stuff. So we introduced Wekinator um, and like how to how to create interactive music, musical instruments, uh, generative art sketches. This is all stuff that we that we did pretty handily in neural aesthetic and 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 very much like the lectures are pretty complete like they have entire um, tutorials basically with, that I did in the classes that show you how to use Wekinator, how to use um, some of the other tools that we looked at ML5 also um, although Yinning's class is probably still more of a complete repository for that but like how to create interactive things like okay the classic thing is a camera that can tell apart objects so. Croissant, coffee cup, right? And once you could do that, you can you can embed it inside of some interactive scenario. So this is a simple thing. It's just changing the background from red to blue, but that could be a trigger for something that's happening in you know some other some kind of a program that you've developed, right? And we're definitely going to try to incorporate interactivity into the autonomous artist. We're going to try to make it interact with us, right? Um, there'll be a lot of opportunities for that. Uh, some people are really interested in physical computing, and that can also be a part of it. Um, one of, um, not my students, but but Andreas, uh, my collaborator Andreas, had a student at CIAD uh, named Bjorn, who does a lot of physical computing stuff, and he basically took that that whole paradigm and put it into a into a little device that could turn appliances on or off. So you open your hand and it turns on the light. Close your hand and it turns off the light, or maybe it's the other way around. I can't tell. Uh, but but he he made this thing called Objectifier. Um, it's featured in creative applications actually, and the idea was that you could like um, train, for example, a book reading lamp. You know, like you'd get in front of, you'd open your book, and there's a camera there that detects that you open the book and it shines a light on your book, or you know, close it, turns the light off. There another one was like a person running a woodcutter, um, and so if it detects that you're your safety goggles are off, turns the woodcutter off. And if your safety goggles are on, it turns it on. So things things of that sort. So you know, embedding these kinds of things into the real world. Um, Andreas and I made this thing called Doodle Classifier, which basically this open frameworks application that can run on anyone's computer. So so it'd be really easy. I'll, maybe at some point we'll do it like a, like I'll I'll do a demonstration of them. Uh, or I might just refer to the to the neural aesthetic because we did a demonstration there, but it depends on how timing is. Uh, basically, it lets you train the thing to detect different categories of drawn objects, and so stars, circles, arrows, and then basically you can it'll find those objects. You draw them, so if you draw something, it detects automatically what you drew, and then you could use that to trigger to trigger all sorts of things. That like uh, we did this thing called do, um, Doodle Tunes that would play music with that. You could uh, Another thing you could do is control your, your keyboard. So this is um, Andreas's old um, uh, business partner. They um, made this company called uh, Story. <laughs> and basically they did funny stuff like this, like playing Tetris with your face. So what's the pipeline here? It's basically 
uh, image. Uh, <laughs> it's it's basically like a face uh, face face OSC more or less like face uh, face detection, uh, face landmark detection, and then using that as your input vector to to a neural network that would then uh, uh, trigger keyboard presses. So you press the left key, you press the right key, you press the space bar to make to turn the object. So we can play video games. Um, I did demonstrations like this. So this is another thing that you could, that you could definitely do. Uh, and yeah, these are just the bigger ecosystem of tools um, that we're able to, to bring in. Um, ML5 will be very useful. Runway will do tutorials on for sure. Wekinator, some of you already know how to use it. And of course, like the old favorites, processing, P5, open frameworks, those are all very much in play. So um, in for interactive stuff in particular. And actually, uh, the ML for a demos are, are, are the, the ML5 demos, more or less, that I've, that I've made, that Andreas has made. Um, so those, those could be useful as well. So I would encourage you to check those out. So this is playing Pong with my face. It's actually quite difficult. I made it too difficult. <laughs> yeah, I lost. So, um, uh, okay, and let me just see how we're doing. Okay. So, ooh, 233, that's rough. Let me just see how. Um, uh, wait, there's oh, way too many slides to go. So, what, what I'm going to do is we'll, okay, we'll go to the end of the neuroaesthetic review and then the stuff, this stuff I'll, I'll I'll save until next week. So okay, so let me just I'll I'll kind of go quickly through these slides. This like we might run like three minutes late or something like that. Does anyone have to rush off at two forty? Like when does it when is the next class? Uh, For it's like a three. Okay, I'll I'll try to finish on time. I might be like two three minutes late or something. But 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 like if anyone has to leave, like definitely just like leave. Um, okay, so. Let me just skip this. Like other stuff that we did in in um, in neural aesthetic, we learned about deep dream and these sort of optimization based techniques for synthesizing images. So I showed how to make images. Okay, so this was deep dream. Maybe some of you saw in two thousand fifteen. This is some work by Google making these crazy psychedelic images. And um, Alex Mordvinsev, who was a researcher at Google turned artist, like uh, very much uh, like really innovated this technique to create uh, amazing images like this. Uh, Mike Tyka followed and started doing stuff like this. Um, and I've been kind of just riffing on the stuff that, especially that Mike introduced, like techniques for, this is some of my own work. So this is basically what you can do with Deep Dream. Um, these are loops. These are three second long loops. And I have the software for doing this online. Um, yeah, some more, some more loops. So this is stuff that like, um, that was, I think, week six, I want to say, just before neural networks. If you're interested in how these things are made, that's week six in the neural aesthetic, called optimization-based uh, deep dream. Style transfer was another thing you could do, and this is kind of self-explanatory, like recompose one image in the style of another image. This is the Mona Lisa in various painting styles. Um, you, could, you could apply it to frames of a video as well. There's actually uh, techniques that do it very smoothly. Like there's repositories for style transfer on movies directly. This is just frame by frame. Um, you could do texture synthesis. This looks like it's a little hard to see because the, the color calibration of the projector is kind of weird. Um, it's bleached out. But this is like Google Maps, basically like fake Google Maps synthesis. So this is what it looks like to look at Google Maps in a nightmare. Like it's just <laughs> zooming in forever. Like, um, so if you ever, like, you know, it's one of those am I dreaming tests, look at your Google Maps and try to zoom in. <laughs> and if it goes anywhere, then you know you're not dreaming. Uh, right? And this could be done, applied to any texture. So I showed how to do stuff like this. And then generative models. This was really the thing that, um, this is really, like, the, the main element, I would say. Generative models are neural networks that synthesize uh, points that look like they came from the original data. So you have a big data set of images of let's say of cats or of TV screens or of cars, and you train a neural network to, to take a random input vector. We're gonna talk about the mechanics of this next week in more detail, um, but 
In fact, you know what I'll do? Like, because we're going to talk about this in more detail next week, maybe it makes sense for me to actually... Uh, um, yeah. Yes, that's what I will do. I'm actually going to more or less skip these slides because we're going to do this in more detail next week, so I'll kind of save it. But basically, we're going to learn about what these are. Generative models, how they work. Again, I'm going to skip this. But generative models are synthesizing images which look like they came from the original data set. So this, for example, what you're looking at is a ge uh, generative model, a type of generative model called a generative adversarial network, again, which was trained on a collection of 100,000, roughly, paintings scraped from wiki art. So I took the entire collection of paintings that, that, that you can find on the website wiki art, I downloaded them, and I trained the generative model. And then once that generative model is trained, it could synthesize what looks like new paintings. And it has this whole notion of a latent space that you can kind of cruise through. And all of these look like plausible paintings, right? And this is going to be, I think, it, not necessarily, but I suspect it will be the core of the autonomous artificial artist. We're going to train one of these, a gigantic um, GAM, on images that we're going to collect. That's going to be, I think, part of the, the recipe. And then it'll be able to synthesize new images that look like portraits and landscapes and all this kind of stuff. So these are some highlights from there. Again, I'll talk about this in more detail tomorrow. And then not tomorrow, next week. Um, these are increasingly realistic. So some of you are probably familiar with big GANs. Lots of people have been tweeting about these. Um, synthesizing hyper-realistic looking dogs and stuff. Um, there is a type of class of generative models that convert one image into another kind of image. So for example, you can turn your face into into the face of Voldemort. There's <laughs> uh, a more realistic version of it. Um, we'll also talk about these a little bit next week. Um, this stuff is getting increasingly realistic, so this is some work from NVIDIA, which just so, jo shows just how insane this stuff is. Um, and, uh, like, yeah, synthesizing car videos. I want to skip... Well, okay, I'll just show you these really quickly. Like, synthesizing people. Right? This is a fake person. Right. Or, I, I mean, it's trained on a real person, so it's a di uh, digital depiction of a real person. Uh, but pretty pretty crazy. Um, everybody, and so I'm going to skip that because it's really awesome, but I, I want to give it, I want to show it in its full detail next week. Uh, cycle GANs is also, like, you do season transfer, you know, depth of field, um, turning horses into zebras, all this kind of stuff is all stuff that we, that we looked at in much more detail in the neural aesthetic. And so the generative models and conditional generative models chapters, those are, those are really, um, <laughs> have all of this information. Oh, we also looked at GLOW, which is a, an invertible generative model that lets you project real images into the, into the generative space. So you can do things like turn, turn your hair blonde, if, if your hair isn't already blonde, like mine, uh, or put heavy makeup on, like this. Uh, that's me in the ni 1980s, you know, so... When I, back when I was in the hair band, hair rock band. Anyway, um, or you could turn yourself into a Canadian pop star. You see the resemblance? Yeah, we're, we're actually, we're cousins. Sorry. Anyway, um, and then, like, there's just all sorts of fun stuff you could do. This was actually, you guys haven't seen this because this was already after a neural aesthetic, but you can project images into... You could use is closely related to style transfer. You could project an image into another image. So that's like the Einstein and Crab Nebula, right? So like I had fun like you know throwing myself into into famous paintings. This is the creepiest thing I've ever done. Just, uh, just sneaking up, right? And, uh, <laughs> So, um, and, and then, and lastly, and I'll, I'll really have to end here because it's already 40 but like one of the other things that we did in Neural Aesthetic was we talked about reinforcement learning, which is training agents to play video games, right? So, um, this, you know, this kind of stuff, basically like learning, uh, like agents that interact with the real world, right? And, and the distinction shouldn't be clear to you right now because we haven't really talked about it in enough detail, uh, but this is possibly also going to be a piece of this course. I think, like, you can have a reinforcement learning agent, and you should be listening, yeah. <laughs> a reinforcement learning agent that, that conducts the entire autonomous artist. I think that's the, that's the secret. 
That's the, that's the goal, I think. But yeah, like if you're familiar with AlphaGo, that was all reinforcement learning stuff. We talked about chess playing and Go playing bots that do you know, amazing, amazing things. And actually, this was, this was Dota. So, so DeepMind uh, was able to train an AI to play this uh, game, Dota, Defense of the Arts, I think it's called. Yes. Ancient. Oh, Ancients, yeah. Um, and actually, just recently in the news, um, I think OpenAI is playing StarCraft. And they're doing, they're doing really, really good. Yeah. So that kind of stuff. Okay. I'm going to save this for next week, but I want to really quickly skip to the last slide because there's an assignment. Um, so, um, yes. So basically next week, we're going to introduce generative models. I, I just cruised to them really, really quickly. And I also want to do a section where we talk about collaborative artworks. Like, like basically, cr like, like this is what, I, what I'd like for you to do. Um, first of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send an email out tonight with, um, with details on how to join the Slack, and I'm going to create a, a special channel just for this class. Um, and what we can do, and then in that, in that channel, like I'm going to share some projects that exemplify this. Basically, I've been collecting artworks, and, and not, not artworks like strictly speaking, but also just creative projects of any sort um, that involve many or, or at least multiple people, but many people uh, often. Um, so like, uh, for example, did anyone see that thing on Reddit, the pixel thing, like where everyone has control of a pixel and then all these artworks spawn out of it, right? Um, so I'm gonna share some, some links on the Slack channel of different examples of this. And I would love uh, for people to like, think of, you think of, an, of an artwork or a creative project that involves pe mul multiple people, let's say at least, Five people, but if but the more people, the better, and um, you know artworks that are a function of many people, and and uh, maybe next week I'd like for everyone to just like show it, you know, maybe spend and very quickly, like like a minute or two minutes, um, and maybe you you can you don't even have to do like I'll, I'll share examples, and if you want to research those examples and show a little bit about them, um, that would be that would be super cool. Uh, we'll figure out how to do that exactly because like we'll need to project it or something. Maybe it won't. I'll email you guys like when I figure out exactly. It might be informal, just describing it. Um, this is not. This should not be a very taxing um, assignment. And then uh, for those of you, especially for those of you who didn't take the class, these are very relevant. These two classes. I, I will share the slides, but it's basically class six um, for uh, which is introduction to generative models. I'm kind of going to do this next week, so, so you know it might help reinforce it a little bit. It might even be better to look at the lectures that are previous to that. And then um, for those of you who are, who are interested, you don't have to do this right now, but, but um, uh, we have, I have this, I think, one hour, something like a one hour lecture called Terminal Velocity, which shows you how to use your computer terminal. So how to run Python scripts, how to do shell scripting and stuff like that. Those are all some of the ninja, ninja skills that are useful for, for a machine learning scientist. Um, so please, uh, please go ahead and do those. Um, okay, so so that's all. Uh, Two forty-five. So I I will uh, send an email out. And for those of you who are around, like come join us at AI Lab tomorrow at five. And and, and if you're late, I know I know some some of you can join us. Um, definitely don't don't worry. Like come by late. Also see if we're still going. And we'll talk about. Let's see. Maybe maybe some weeks we might be able to do five thirty. Um, but for for tomorrow it's definitely five. Um, and um, yeah. So come join us. Great. Cool guys. See you. See you soon. Good luck in your next task. Oh.